Hi guys welcome to another video so today I'm here for telling you a 10 most compelling pieces of evidence that prove aliens have visited earth. So let's start with the number 10. Drawings, paintings, carvings, and other records of ancient times. With humans having walked the earth for an estimated 200,000 years, some might call the following a little short-sighted. And yet here we are. I will take everything that came before the advent of television. 1939, and stuff it in the first section. I do so with the utmost pride and sincerity. Sure, a lot happened during the first 199,926 years, but sources being what they were, let's just sum it up to one thing, drawings. A ton of them. All over the world, and throughout the ages, drawings, paintings, carvings, quilts and markings. They may each tell a different story. But in the end they all say the same thing, we are not alone. Number 9. The Phantom Airships of the 1880s. Okay, I lied. I admit it. I lied. And I don't feel bad about it either. I promised to jump right up to the second quarter of the 20th century, but I just can't do it. Because that wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be fair to all you paranoid, conspiracy-hungry, culture junkies out there thirsty for that little bit of mystery and wonder amidst your workaday world. Before getting into the strange events that happened during World War II, or the bizarre phenomena which basically started the modern ufology movement, I must first address the thing that came before it. The thing that, some say, started it all. It was an international marvel of the unexplained, and at the height of the Industrial Revolution, and more than 20 years before the Great War. The world was both shaken and stirred. Reports of mystery airships were popping up everywhere. In the United States the sightings began in the west and spread eastward. The first major case happened in New Mexico on March 26, 1880 in the skies above a small town called Galista Junction, now known as Lamy. Voices were heard, voices which seemed to be coming from the sky above. When the people looked up they saw a circular ship, monstrous in size. Its movements were described as approaching rapidly and then slowed to an elegant waltz across the sky. It is said that the occupants of these ships were human, but their clothing and behavior was bizarre. Number 8. The Foo Fighters Most of us are familiar with the band helmed by Dave Grawl, Nirvana's ex-drummer. But many have no idea where they got their name. During the Second World War, the greatest armed conflict the world had ever known. Something we did must have got their attention. The sightings officially began in Nuremberg, Aliens Love Germany? In November of 1944, but there had been whispers about them for years prior, only with less frequency. Strange mystery airships were popping up everywhere and being seen by both pilots and the men on the ground. The Allied forces believed they were covert weaponry from the Axis powers. Ironically the German and Japanese forces reported the same up their military chain and they assumed they were products of our allied forces. They were described as fiery glowing lights, moving fast in the sky or low to the ground. They range in color from red, to yellow, orange and white, sound familiar? It was said they would toy with our aircrafts, following our every maneuver before making impossible maneuvers of their own and then disappearing into the night. All sides of the war were unanimous, these craft, these, discs, these lights, were under intelligent control. They were not some natural phenomenon. Efforts to outmaneuver them failed. Attempts to shoot them down failed. The pilots were scared, and there was nothing anybody could do about it. The Pacific sightings were different from those in Europe. There, they were described as flaming discs which just hung in the sky. They rarely followed any of the fighters. A Times Magazine report from 1945 states that B-29 aircraft fire took one of these down. The ball simply broke up into several pieces crashing down, lighting several buildings on fire. No pieces were ever reported to be found. The Europeans on our side dubbed them crowd fire balls. In the Pacific theater of operations they were just called balls of fire. The North Americans called them Foo Fighters. The name can be credited to Donald J. Myers, a radar operator for the 415th Night Fighter Squadron from Chicago. 
Myers and another pilot by the name of Ed Schluter were chased by one of these strange red balls of fire on the afternoon of November 27, 1944. In their mission of debriefing with S-2 intelligence officer Fritz Ringwald, Myers was agitated. When asked what had happened he exclaimed, it was another one of those Foo Fighters. He stormed out of the debriefing room and history was made. In January of 1953, as a result of the Project Blue Book investigations, the Roberts and Panel met and attempted to explain the sightings. They suggested electromagnetic phenomena of unknown nature, electrostatic phenomena of unknown nature and St. Elmo's fire. In the end, the report states events remain unexplained to this day, but there were two things they did know for sure. These lights in the sky never posed a threat to military aircraft and it was suggested that if the term flying saucers had been popular in 1943-1945, these objects would have certainly been so labeled. At the time, everybody took these sightings extremely seriously, scientists from all over the world and both sides of the war were brought together to figure out what they were and who they were fighting for. The answers have yet to come. Number 7 is 1947, Kenneth Arnold, the first flying saucer, and the dawn of ufology. On June 24, 1947, a private Idaho pilot by the name of Kenneth Arnold was flying from Chehillis, to Yakima, Washington, on a business trip. It was during this flight that he spotted a string of nine unidentified, shining, metallic, flying objects. The objects flew past Mount Rainier, moving at supersonic speed. A feat modern aircraft had only recently achieved and up until then, only in nose dives. Arnold clocked the crafts at a minimum of 1,200 miles an hour, 1,932 kilometers per hour. 1A. U.S. Marine Corps C-46 transport airplane had crashed near Mount Rainier. A $5,000 reward was offered for the discovery of the lost plane. The skies were completely clear. He spotted a light coming from behind him, and after pulling all the necessary maneuvers and even rolling his windows down to make sure it wasn't simply a reflection, he concluded it was another craft. Thirty seconds after seeing the first flash of light, Arnold saw a series of bright flashes in the distance north of Mount Rainier, a total of nine of them were now flying in a straight line to his left. The objects flew in a long chain, had no tail and emitted no contrails. The objects approached him and suddenly flew past him. He said they moved, like saucers skipping on water and with that, the term flying saucer was born. The objects were said to hold a diagonal echelon formation, all lined up like a flock of birds, and they weaved from side to side, like the tail of a Chinese kite as he later stated. They darted through the valleys and around the smaller mountain peaks and would occasionally flip or bank on their edges, in unison as they turned or maneuvered. Their motion caused bright, mirror-like flashes of light. The encounter gave him an eerie feeling. He first thought he was seeing test flights of a new U.S. military aircraft. When he did the calculation, he estimated their speed at over 1,700 miles per hour, 2,700 kilometers per hour. This was about three times faster than any manned aircraft in 1947. Not knowing the exact distance where the objects faded from view, he decided to conservatively and orbit rarely round his previous figure down to 1,200 miles, 1,900 kilometers, an hour, still faster than any known aircraft of that era. Army pilots told him that briefings before combat often mentioned seeing objects of similar shape and design and they assured him that he wasn't dreaming or going crazy. In a July 19th interview, Arnold had this to say, the discs are not from any foreign country. The army would give the answers if it could, if they don't have the explanation now, they certainly could do something to find out. If the army has no explanations the discs must be, and I know this sounds crazy, from another planet. In an interview in April of the following year he stated, since my first observations and report of the so-called flying disks I have spent a great deal of money and time thoroughly investigating the subject. There is no doubt in my mind that these objects are aircraft of a strange design, and material that is unknown to the civilizations of this earth. Did that at least creep you out a little bit? No? Okay, well, 
Let's check out the case it lead right into, a case Kenneth Arnold himself spent much time and money investigating. Number 6. The Maury Island Incident. Maury Island is a small island in Puget Sound, near Tacoma, Washington. On June 21, 1947, three days before the Kenneth Arnold Incident, Seaman Harold A. Dahl witnessed several objects flying over Maury Island. One of the objects he witnessed exploded, raining down fragments below. It was a bright day, the sea was calm, and the skies were blue and crystal clear. Dahl was with his son Charles, an unnamed buddy, and Dahl's dog. They were scavenging for logs, because apparently he really can't cook and his son really needs the fiber, or something. His dog began to bark, and upon looking out, they witnessed four or five donut-shaped objects flying over the area. Dahl stated in his FBI report that one of the objects seemed to be malfunctioning and that another flying disc approached the first. The second quickly retreated and as it did so, the first disc began to eject metallic chunks. The debris rained down on his boat, smashing his windshield, shattering a light fixture and in a sad twist, one of the larger chunks killed his dog. His son is said to have sustained minor injuries as well. Dahl took photos of the entire event. He also recovered some type of slag ejected from the malfunctioning craft. Samples of sheets of lightweight, white, metal were also recovered by Dahl and his crew. He claimed they fluttered like newspapers out from the inner ring of the troubled UFO. The Dahl family and his friend went home, to Tacoma, never speaking of what had occurred. The next morning, a visitor, wearing a black suit and driving a 1947 Buick, showed up to his house. The man invited Dahl out for breakfast in a local diner and once there, he conducted an interview. Dahl claims the man retold the events on the boat as if he had been there, although Dahl himself hadn't related the story publicly at that point. The man told Dahl exactly what Dahl had seen without Dahl ever being asked a single thing. Then, Dahl claims, the man told him that, should he speak of what he'd seen to anybody, great harm would come to him and his family. The next day Dahl, who one can only assume doesn't take SHT from nobody told everything that had happened to him to a co-worker by the name of Fred Chrisman. At this point I'm going to go on a little tangent here. Fred Chrisman is a teacher, author and all-around peace disturber who has since the 1940s been involved in several conspiracies. In fact, Fred Chrisman was once linked to the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Early reports placed Chrisman on the grassy knoll at the time of the assassination. Conspiracy theorists would later claim this was an attempt to tarnish his name and take away his credibility when speaking of various other government cover-ups, of which the Maury Island incident is one. Chew on that, non-believer. The reason Dahl told Chrisman what happened is that Chrisman was co-owner of the boat Dahl had been on. He and Dahl were both involved in the business of scavenging for logs to sell as raw lumber. A business venture which is, in this author's opinion, some pretty stupid and shady shit. And so when Chrisman asked Dahl to explain the damage to the boat, Dahl, unable to come up with a good lie, broke down and told the truth. Never shying away from a good mystery, Chrisman went out to investigate. He found strange sheets of metal strewed out along the beach. According to FBI reports, Chrisman collected some samples and sent them out to a friend at the University of Chicago for analysis. Upon being unable to identify the material, this unnamed friend sent the samples to Ray Palmer, science fiction writer and editor of Amazing Science Fiction. That's when our story gets a little strange. That's right. Now is where it gets strange, because everything that came before the following is just business as usual. While the samples were being passed around Chicago for analysis, leaving a trail of confused scientists in their wake, Ray Palmer, writer extraordinaire, decided to contact none other than Idaho pilot, Kenneth Arnold, a now reputable source on the matter, desperate to prove what he had witnessed a few weeks prior was real. Once in Tacoma, Kenneth Arnold, Fred Chrisman, and Harold Dahl, met with Captain William L. Davidson and Lieutenant Frank M. Brown of Army A2 Intelligence, at the Winthrop Hotel. They met and discussed the events in detail over several days. The two intelligence officers decided to return to their base in California. Before they left, Chrisman, 
who had retrieved some of the strange metallic rock formation spat out by the malfunctioning ship, gave it to the investigators to take back to California for further analysis. The plane carrying the two investigators, and the strange metal, mysteriously crashed near Kelso, Washington, shortly after leaving Tacoma, killing both officers. The material they carried was allegedly never found and claims they carried secret cargo with them was denied up until 2007. Chrisman told Arnold of the crash. The three men, Dahl, Chrisman, and Arnold, once again met at the Winthrop Hotel. Arnold brought another friend with him. The Freedom of Information copy of the FBI report refers to this man as a Mr. Smith of Seattle I shit you not. That is the name he is given in the official FBI report's release. During this time Paul Lance of the Tacoma Times contacted Arnold at the hotel. They spoke, and Lance informed Arnold that much of the information they'd been discussing had somehow been leaked to the press. The rest of their conversation remains unknown. The men began feeling the heat. Dahl was asked to produce the photographs he had taken of the UFOs. Once back at his car he claimed the photos had been stolen from his glove compartment. Feeling things were getting alarmingly unverifiable the crew decided to go back to the site of the crash and gather more evidence. The boat failed to start. When Smith asked Dahl and Chrisman where the fragments had damaged the boat, in an effort to gather what little evidence they could, all were shocked to see repairs had been made to all the affected portions of the boat. Soon after Dahl just disappeared. He was never seen again. FBI reports mention his son, allegedly injured by the slag from the malfunctioning UFO, ran away from home to Montana, for no explained reason. Chrisman, a World War II veteran, was suddenly and inexplicably called back into service. He was sent to Alaska just a few days later. Incidentally, a UFO was spotted northwest of Bethel, Alaska on August 4, just a few days prior by Captain Jack Beck and co-pilot Vince Daly. Sometime after that, Chrisman was sent to Greenland. Another interesting little anecdote is that the Chrisman was stationed at Thule Air Force Base. Thule is a Greenland Air Force Base which figures prominently in Milton William Cooper's conspiracy book, Behold a Pale Horse as a Majestic 12 and Operation Majority, Control Terminus. Behold a Pale Horse is a conspiracy book described as the manifesto of the militia movement. Paul Gilroy describes the book as an elaborate conspiracy theory that encompasses the Kennedy assassination, the doings of the secret world government, the coming Ice Age, and a variety of other covert activities associated with the Illuminati's declaration of war upon the people of America. It is also said to be, among the most complex super-conspiracy theories and the most influential. Historian Nicholas Goodrick Clark states that it is, a chaotic farrago of conspiracy myths interspersed with reprints of executive laws, official papers, reports and other extraneous materials designed to show the looming prospect of a world government imposed on the American people against their wishes and in flagrant contempt of the Constitution. I think it's in everybody's interest to note that people rarely claim it's untrue, just extremely intense and definitely paranoid. The samples of material both Arnold and sci-fi writer Palmer had received, also went missing. After the disappearance of the last shred of evidence, Ted Morello of the United Press told Arnold, you're involved in something that is beyond our power here to find out anything about. Get out of this town until whatever it is blows over. Paul Lance, the reporter from the Tacoma Times, who Arnold had been in close conversation with during the entire ordeal died within two weeks of the events of undetermined causes. The Roswell UFO incident occurred 12 days after Dahl first sighted the malfunctioning UFO above his boat, over a calm sea, and beneath the clear blue skies, off Maury Island. For those of you keeping score, that last story involved missing evidence, small town hicks, men in black, UFOs, disappearances, the FBI and the military. I'd call that a double hat trick. Number 5. The Mid-70s Abduction Wave On October 10, 1973, 15 eyewitnesses, two of whom were police officers all report seeing a large, silver craft hovering over a housing project in St. Tammany Parish, New Orleans, Louisiana. On October 11, 1973, two co-workers, 
Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker went fishing on the west bank of the Pascagoula River in Mississippi. Out of nowhere flashing lights appeared. Then a strange craft materialized in front of them, it was eight feet across and about eight feet high. They say it levitated two feet off the ground. The rest of the tale is purely eyewitness and there is no evidence to corroborate their claims, but you've got the name so please, look it up. Two years later, November, 5, 1975, in Apache Sit Greaves National Forest, Arizona, we have the curious case of Travis Walton. I won't go into the details here, but I will give a brief summary. Travis Walton and his crew of six men, Foreman Mike Roger, Ken Peterson, John Goulet, Steve Pierce, Alan Dillis and Wayne Smith are loggers on a contract. Just after 6 p.m. on November 5th, Rogers and his crew pile into Rogers' car and head home, towards Snowflake, Arizona. Off in the distance they spot some bright lights. Walton goes out to investigate. They see a spacecraft. Walton is knocked down by a flashing light. His boys drive off, scared. A statewide search for Walton begins along with a murder investigation. Five days later, Walton is found, disoriented, dehydrated, weak, and hungry. Walton himself has since taken a total of three polygraph tests, the first resulted in an inconclusive, though many will argue he straight up failed. However he passed the next two with flying colors. His entire crew was also polygraphed shortly after his disappearance, but before he was found. They all passed the test save for Alan Dallas who is believed to have been on drugs at the time. UFO researchers Jenny Randalls and Peter Hoff have said, neither before or since has an abduction story begun in the manner related by Walton and his co-workers. Furthermore, the Walton case is singular in that the victim vanished for days on end with police squads out searching, it is an atypical close encounter of the fourth kind. Walton himself has said, it was many years ago that I got out of a crew truck in the National Forest and ran toward a large glowing UFO hovering in the darkening Arizona sky. But when I made that fateful choice to leave the truck, I was leaving behind more than just my six fellow workmen. I was leaving behind forever all semblance of a normal life, running headlong toward an experience so overwhelmingly mind-rending in its effects, so devastating in its aftermath, that my life would never could never be the same again, moving on to 1976. If you're looking for another reason never to visit Maine, here's a straight abduction story with all the tropes of an 80s horror film. Except for the sex and murder, which I guess makes it pretty lame. Twin brothers Jack and Jim Weiner, along with their friends Chuck Rack and Charlie Foltz decide to go on a little camping trip in the woods near Lagosh, Maine. It was a fishing expedition. They were in their early twenties and by all accounts, they were going to have the time of their lives. On the night of August 20th, they decide to do a little fishing. Just to play it safe, they light a giant fire on the bank next to their campsite on the edge of Eagle Lake. This guarantees they'll find their way back because, you know, flashlights are for idiots. Once out on the river in their canoe, flaming beacon within view, the boys proceed to do some fishing. After a few minutes out on the lake, Rack, the bad boy and lady killer of the crew, notices a light out of the corner of his eye. It hovers above the tree line, silently. Folds, the brains of the operation, grabs a flashlight and flashes an SOS towards the gigantic, glowing orb, mysteriously levitating several dozen feet in the air above the ominous forest. Suddenly, and beyond all expectation, the orb reacts to their pleas for attention. A shining beam exits the orb and shoots towards them, they're blinded by the light, which was, incidentally speaking, Jack and Jim's favorite song having been released earlier that month in the UK at this point, the light envelopes the entire canoe and the four men. In the blink of an eye the men find themselves back on the shore, by their campsite. The craft still hovers just over 12 feet away from them. They stare at it for a little while and suddenly the ship implodes, disappearing and reappearing just on the other side of the river. The fire they had made just a few moments ago, was now mere embers. They'd been gone for two hours. The rest of the trip goes without incident, but for the next decade each man is haunted by nightmares of a bizarre nature. In 1988, 
After Jim's visit to a UFO convention the boys finally get to talking and realize that for over 10 years they'd all been sharing the same nightmare. A nightmare that includes nudity, rape, medical examinations and the theft of sperm samples, taken directly from the source, using syringes. Raymond Fowler, a host of the convention and Jim's new confidant, takes interest in their story. Being familiar with scientific methods of investigation, Fowler suggests the four men undergo regressive hypnosis. It is then determined that all men had been part of an abduction. They have since all passed lie detector tests confirming they believe what they claim. Now, I know what you're thinking. Abductions are all well and good, and regressive hypnosis is practically as valid as a closed-circuit camera feed, but where's the evidence? Well dear reader, all you had to do was ask. Number 4. Physical Evidence All right so far all we've seen are old works of art some crazy eyewitness reports and a few bizarre stories involving the FBI and the military. That's not much to go on I suppose, so now let's get into some actual physical evidence. 1957, the Yuba Yuba UFO metal fragments On September 14, 1957, Ibrahim Sood, a columnist for the Rio de Janeiro newspaper Zero Globo received an anonymous litter. A man, who chose to remain anonymous, told him what he'd seen, just a few days prior. The letter began with these words, Dear Mr. Ibrahim Sood, I wish to give you something of the highest interest to a newspaper man, about the flying discs. The letter goes on to state that its author had never been a believer, but that events he'd witnessed had changed his mind. I was fishing together with some friends, at a place close to the town of Ubichuba, Sao Paulo, when I sighted a flying disc. The letter then describes the disc crashing at lightning speed towards the beach. Impact with water was imminent, but suddenly, inches away from the crash, the ship just reversed its trajectory, it shot up into the air, and exploded. The midday sky is described as lighting up like fireworks, fragments rained down. Most were lost underwater. But a few survived, and the fisherman and his crew had found them. Sood's interest was piqued. He contacted the man and arranged to retrieve the fragments for analysis. On September 24, 1957, Ibrahim Sood took the shards to the Mineral Production Laboratory. It's a division of the National Department of Mineral Production in the Agriculture Ministry of Brazil. The laboratory is the official Brazilian institution for the examination and analysis of mineral substances, metallic ores, metals and alloys. The shards were analyzed by the chief chemist of the spectrographic section of the Mineral Production Laboratory, Dr. Luisa Maria A. Barbosa. The samples were registered as being of unknown origin. Barbosa's final analysis report, the spectrographic analysis identified the unknown metal as magnesium, Mg, and showed it to be absolutely pure as it can be concluded from the study of the spectrographic plate taken with the Hilger spectrograph. No other metal or impurity was detected in the sample analyzed, even the so-called trace elements, usually found with any metal, were not present. X-ray spectrometry and X-ray diffractometry both confirmed the previous report. Also, and this is strictly for the Uber geek, the magnesium's density was off. Off in the sense that no known magnesium should have this density at this level of purity. Under these exact circumstances the magnesium's relative density should have been 1.741, but a significantly higher density was found. The carefully measured density of this magnesium sample was 1.866. The procedure was repeated three times with a microbalance, and the same value was found each time. So in conclusion, the metal was too pure to be natural and too dense to be human. We didn't make it. We couldn't have made it and we can't yet see why nature would have. Splitting hairs? Maybe. Okay, try this next one. 1965 Cherry Creek, New York August 19, 1965, William Butcher, 16 years old, is out in the dairy barn having a good old time, milking some cows, listening to the radio. It's about 8.20 p.m., the milking machine is powered by tractor, don't ask and the radio is playing a news broadcast along with occasional music. Suddenly, radio static, the tractor engine shuts down. A Holstein bull begins acting up, 
pulling at a chain attached to a steel railing he's tied up to. The bull along with some cows jumps, kicks and bucks, they make all kinds of ungodly noises. William runs to the window to see what the commotion is about. What he sees is an oval-shaped UFO about one-fourth mile away from the barn. The object is about 50 feet long and 20 feet thick. A red mist emanates from the craft, which suddenly shoots up into the clouds above. William calls his family out. They run outside to witness what's happening. There's a strange odor outside and up in the sky, the clouds glow a strange green. The police are called in to investigate. The next day Captain James Dorsey, Operations Officer, 4621st Half Group, arrives at the scene, bringing with him four technicians. They discover a strange, purple liquid in several places along the ground. The grass is singed, and unexplained marks, two inches wide and two inches apart, are found beneath the exact spot the craft was hovering. The purple liquid was analyzed by the Kovetsky Chemical Company. The company president had this to say, spectrographic analysis showed the main elements of the liquid to be aluminium, iron and silicon. Some phosphorus was found in the weed samples, which the analyst said might cause a phosphate smell, explaining the odor. The next day state trooper Richard Ward sees an unknown object with eight circular lights flying twice as fast as a jet. The object emits a faint sound. The National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena stated in a subsequent report that they believed the incident to be genuine. It has been labeled as a true unknown. The electromagnetic disturbances that affected the radio and the tractor have yet to be explained. The Air Force came in, taping the area off. The military confiscated all photos and other evidence the family acquired. William Butcher was told by military officers that if any subsequent photos or evidence were to be released in the future, he would be arrested and either placed in jail or in asylum. The Cherry Creek incident is one of over 600 cases investigated by the Air Force between 1948 and 1969. Case files released under the Freedom of Information Act have most pertinent information like names, dates and addresses, completely blacked out. The Falcon Lake encounter of 1967 On May 20, 1967, Stefan Michalak was in the White Shell Provincial Park in Manitoba, Canada, prospecting for silver. It was a hobby of his. At around 12 p.m. he was startled by the sound of geese flying away. He looked up and was shocked to see two elongated objects descending toward the ground. They were glowing a reddish color. The closer they got, the more their shape became clear, they were disc-shaped. One of the UFOs hovered in midair while the other made a landing about 150 feet away from him. The craft emitted purple lights and a strange smell, like sulfur. For a half-hour Michilak stood before the craft making a detailed sketch to the best of his ability. Suddenly an opening appeared in the aircraft. Being the curious guy he is, he felt he had no choice. He moved in for a closer look. From just outside the door, he could see inside the craft. There were panels of different colored lights, and light beams crossing each other like security laser beams in movies. The panel array was similar to a display on a computer. He could not see any living beings in the craft, and decided to walk back. To distance himself from the UFO. But then, he had to get a better look at the material. He examined the exterior of the craft. He describes it as highly polished colored glass with no breaks or seams in its surface. When he put his hand on it, his glove was melted by the heat. A vent in the craft opened up and a blast of heat shot out as the UFO rose off the ground and took to the skies. Michalak's shirt and undershirt caught fire. The craft flew away. Michalak tore his clothes off and stomped them out. Soon after, he suffered from a bad headache and nausea. He broke into a cold sweat, vomited and made his way to the hospital. He showed signs of hair loss and a series of raised oval-shaped sores on his chest and abdomen in a grid-like pattern. The sores were treated as first-degree burns. On July 28, Michalak and a few RCMP officers found a semicircle on the rock face at the scene, 15 feet in diameter, where the moss had been somehow removed. There were traces of radiation in a fault in the rock across the center of the landing spot. 
No trace of radiation was found around the outer perimeter of the circle or in the moss or grass below the raised portion of the rock. Dr. Horace Dudley, a radiologist and a pro advisor at the University of Southern Mississippi, observed that Mitchell acts. Nausea and vomiting followed by diarrhea and loss of weight is a classical picture of severe whole body radiation with X or gamma rays. I would guess that Mr. Michalak received on the order of 100-200 row endgens. Strange metal was also found at the site, silver of improbable purity. In the days following Michalak's report, several dozen other witnesses came forward claiming they had seen a similar object in the air, in the surrounding areas on that same day. Number 3. The Chinese Air Force Sighting Let's take a jump to the postmodern age. The following occurred on October 19, 1998 in the Communist Red Menace of China. A government-controlled newspaper reported the sighting which is said to have been, just like, ones in foreign movies. Four military radar stations in Hebei Province, China reported the presence of an unidentified blip hovering above a military flight training school in Changzhou. Authorities quickly determined that the intruder was not a military or civilian flight. Colonel Li, the base commander, ordered a Jiangjiao-6 jet fighter to intercept the UFO and determine exactly what it was. At least 140 people on the ground saw the object. The observers stated the UFO first appeared to be a small star and then grew larger and larger perhaps as it descended to a lower altitude. They described the object as a mushroom-shaped dome on top and a flat bottom covered with bright, continually rotating lights. The pilot and radar officer present on the jet stated, the object clearly resembled depictions they had seen in foreign science fiction films. When they were within 4,000 meters, 13,200 feet, of the UFO over King County, it suddenly shot upwards easily evading subsequent attempts to get closer. The pilots stated that the UFO appeared to be toying with them. It repeatedly outdistanced them before reappearing right above their jet. The pilot requested permission to fire on the UFO with the plane's automatic 20mm cannon. Ground control denied him permission to shoot. They were ordered to continue pursuit and observe the object. The pilot broke off pursuit at an altitude of 12,000 meters. 39,600 feet, when the jet began running low on fuel. The UFO then disappeared before two more modern, Chinese fighter, planes could arrive in the area. The story first ran in the Hebe Daily on October 22 and was later picked up by the Chinese weekly news magazine Bayakin Wenzhai. Number 2. The Shite on Mazar, Russia UFO Crash this little doozy happened in the former communist red menace of Russia. On August 28, 1991, at 442, local time, an extremely large object appeared over the Caspian Sea. It measured approximately 600 meters long, and 110 meters in diameter. The tracking station on the Manishluk Peninsula was the first to spot it on its radar screens. Radar computations showed the object moving at the speed of 597 miles per hour, or 960 kilometers per hour at an altitude of 21,000 feet. It measured a length of 600 meters and had a diameter of about 110 meters. Seeing that the object didn't respond on the IFF, identification friend or foe, requests, they acted immediately. Two MiG-29 fighters were dispatched to ascertain the threat level. At 5.12 a.m. the interception occurred. Their orders were to close in from either side. Fly parallel to the target and fire warning shots in its path. Then to lead the UFO down for a safe landing. When pilots attempted to fire, there was no response from their controls. None of the electrical systems worked. The cockpit controls were dead, and soon after, the engines began to malfunction. The planes were now non-operational. Their condition was radioed to headquarters. They were ordered to abandon the hunt return back to base. Radar on the ground continued to track the object. Approximately 45 minutes after its initial sighting, at 5.27 a.m., the object vanished from radar screens. But the encounter was far from over. Soon after these events word spread of a large object crash landing into the mountains of Shaitan Mazar. 
Residents of the villages around Kairoka witnessed an object of immense size, crashing deep in the mountains, to the east, in a rocky gorge called the Grave of the Devil. Due to risks of avalanche, retrieval was made difficult. A Russian Air Force military helicopter located the crash site in November 1991 and attempted to hoist the object out of a snow-covered bank. The helicopter inexplicably crashed, killing everybody on board. Winter was at hand, and the Air Force stated that no further attempts at retrieving the craft were planned until the following spring. A second expedition was undertaken in the spring. They located the object and stated that it seemed to be emitting an energy field of some kind. Expedition member Emil Bakhern is quoted as saying, you could feel it all around. Evidence of this energy field is reflected in the fact that compasses began acting strangely. Their magnetic arrows instantly took up a position pointing along the object, showing the direction north, south, though the true setup of the object was west, east. Another bizarre effect was that the arrows pointed in these directions straight, without continued swinging or spinning. Magnetometers were used to analyze the anomaly. Magnetometers are instruments used to measure the magnetization of a material, like a ferromagnet, or to measure the strength and or direction of the magnetic field at a point in space. The readings were contradictory. The gradual magnetometric shooting analysis revealed the form and character of the anomaly created by the craft but from a distance of 800 to 820 meters, the magnetic field was completely absent. Not just from the ship, but from everything, which includes natural rocks that are in every sense of the word, magnetic. The conditions necessary to completely demagnetize such rocks as diorite, gabbro, pyroxene, all of which contain plenty of magnetic minerals, including magnetite, are not only unknown, but many would consider it impossible. Also, all of the electronic clocks, which had been in direct visibility of the UFO, at distance of 1.51.2 km, failed. They reset to zero and they did not restore normal function once outside of the zone of influence. All clocks and wristwatches stopped at a distance of 600 meters from the object. Anyone who approached the object began to suffer from radiation burns at a distance of 500 meters. They also suffered from nausea, extreme fatigue and what's described as, a sense of dread. Members of the expedition described the craft as having strange green symbols located on the tail part of the object, and rings of a dark color, surrounding a stern. Possibly the rings are a part of the engine. The exact coordinates of the crash are northern latitude between 42.010-42.012, and an eastern longitude between 79.040-79.042. It is located in Kyrgyzha, to the east of Lake Iskkal, 100 kilometers east of the town of Przevolsk. It is opposite peak of a victory, Pikpobody, in Russian. Due to its remoteness, and the plethora of misinformation, it is unknown whether or not the site has since been properly excavated or what has been found. At the first number Peter Cowrie's Space Threesome, Strange Chicks and Stranger DNA On the morning of July 23, 1992 at 7.30 a.m., while Peter Cowrie lay in bed in his Sydney, Australia home, something that can only be described as porntastic, in a purely 80s way, happened. He woke up shocked to see two strange women kneeling naked on the edge of his bed. One appeared Nordic and the other Asian. They both had eyes about twice the size of normal eyes. The blonde had unnaturally light skin and she wore her hair in an uppity extreme curly wave style that would have put Farrah Fawcett to shame. Her Asian-looking friend had completely black eyes, and she rocked the traditional pageboy style made famous by Asian schoolgirls the world over. Both women, though quite thin, and nicely shaped, were over six feet tall, and extremely strong. Their faces, though attractive, were described as too chiseled and too long with very high cheekbones. Almost like caricatures of beautiful supermodels, but made of actual flesh. In short, they were inhuman. Hot, but inhuman. The women seemed to be communicating telepathically. They exchanged looks and physically reacted to one another, but no words were spoken and their expressions were strangely, eerily blank, like Stefford wives. The blonde seemed to be explaining to the Asian how this was going to go. 
The blonde then reached out and using both hands, she took Kaori's head and pressed it against her breasts. He tried to pull away, and she resisted him. His mouth was literally pressed into her nipples. She was pretty strong, I didn't know what to do. Kaori was freaking out. So like any red-blooded male pressed up against a woman's nipples, he bit her. Hard. I don't know why I did it. I just didn't know what else to do. Kaori states he felt a small piece of her nipple come away in his teeth. However the woman didn't cry out or tear up as he, or any other misogynist with a hard on, would have hoped. Kaori states, the expression on her face was like, this isn't the way. In a way it was shock or confusion. She looked at the Asian one. And looked at me like, this isn't the way it's supposed to happen. You've done this wrong. Kaori started choking on the piece of nipple caught in his throat. He eventually swallowed it, but by the time his coughing fit was over, the women had vanished. He realized that his penis felt very painful. In the washroom, he pulled back the foreskin and found two thin blonde strands of hair wrapped tightly around it. He struggled to unravel the pieces of hair as the pain became an intense burning sensation. Finally he managed to remove the two pieces of hair and immediately put them in a small sealable plastic bag. The pieces of hair became the subject of the first openly reported scientific DNA test. It was also the first openly reported non-human space rape, an alien menage a wa case of the modern world. The blonde hairs were almost transparent. It was quickly determined that they had not been chemically treated, because if they had been, little or no mitochondrial DNA could have been recovered. Using the PCR, polymerase chain reaction, process, DNA was recovered. Scientists of the Anomaly Physical Evidence Group stated that the thin blonde hair which had come from an apparently light-skinned Caucasian-type woman, actually belonged to something else entirely. It was human, but somehow it showed five distinctive DNA markers that are characteristic of a rare subgroup of the Chinese mongoloid racial type. Since the Human Genome Project there have only been four women, on the entire planet to have these five distinct markers, all them were Chinese, with black hair. Another odd little thing is that the hair contains two deleted genes for CCR5 protein and no intact gene for normal undeleted CCR5. This person has no, and cannot produce any CCR5 protein. For those of you who might not know, some people in the world are born resistant to the AIDS virus, it's an anomaly, and scientists believe that further study into these people might someday cure the disease. All people naturally resistant to AIDS have a portion of their CCR5 protein missing. This girl had all of it missing, making her completely immune to the virus, among other things, which I guess would come in handy, if you are a space alien, human hybrid, mating with randoms in the night, in an effort to further your genetic stockpile or diversity. Finally my thoughts says. The world is, and has always been full of wonders. Some mysteries reveal deep truths about the human condition. Others, dark nightmarish realms where we mere mortals should not tread. Both science and religion are constant reminders that there is more going on than meets the eye. And under the surface, lay questions that, when answered, only lead to new mysteries. The natural diversity of our world sometimes seems practically infinite, but as it turns out, some of that diversity might not be local or so naturally occurring at all. We are but a small stage in a vast cosmic arena. The question is, are there other players? What do you think? Have aliens visited our planet in the past? Do you yourself know of some pretty damning evidence that's been omitted from this video? Or is this whole thing just a passing fad and a sign of the times? Leave comments below.